Am I allowed to start now, Mark? Carry on. All good. So Mark, very kindly, um, let me tell my, he's going to let me tell my story about my deal in West Brom, which I did in 1991. Now, for most of you, I do appreciate that 1991 is an awful long time ago. Uh, um, can you see, my head's not shot, chopped off, is it? No, no, it's fine, mate. Good, okay. So, um, in 1991, we were buying blocks of, uh, we were buying tower blocks, blocks of flats off local authorities and Sanwell District Council had a block of 80 flats that um, were for sale and we agreed to pay 400,000 for this block of 80 flats. The reason they were selling flats was because these blocks was because to blow them up was half a million pounds and they felt well rather than blow them up and spend the money, waste money doing that, we can give them to someone else who's got the money to spend on them and we used to refurbish them and sell the first time buyers. So I got to West Brom, looked at this tower block, said yep yeah, we'll buy it, it's no problem. I looked across and I saw another two massive blocks of 140 flats each. And I said, who, who, I said, who, who owns those? And they said, oh, we sold those six months ago. So uh, and this, you've got to make things happen for yourself. So I found out who bought them. It was an Irish guy who bought them. And I also found out that he paid 75,000 each for these two blocks. And his idea was to refurbish them and, uh, and, and sell them. Anyway. I agreed to pay him 1.55 million for these two blocks. Now, first lesson is there, is never worry about what someone else has paid for a property or how much they're gonna make out of you because that's totally irrelevant. You weren't clever enough to do it, they were. Doesn't mean you can't make money out of it. So if you're confident about your ability and what you do, don't worry about it. Don't worry about what someone's paid for. I've got, I know so many people who won't pay um, to buy, won't buy a property, although it's a good deal still, because someone's making money out of them. Well, you know, that's life. The world has to go around. Don't, do not ever worry about that. So I agreed to pay 1.5 million to start with. Anyway, after a little while, he started giving us the runaround. Bear in mind, he only paid 75,000 each for these two blocks, 150,000 in total. It's got to be the, the deal of his lifetime, surely. I eventually, I rang, rang his, his home one day because I couldn't get hold of his solicitor, and nothing was happening on the deal. And uh, we're all set to exchange and then he went to the ground on us. So I rang his home, I spoke to, um, I spoke to his wife in Stourbridge who said, oh, he's at a, he's at a brick-a-brack fair at Stafford Showground uh, today. And I live in Ipswich in Suffolk, I still do. I jumped in my car, drove three and a half hours, got to Stafford Showground, found him selling brick-a-brack for like, you know, pennies. And I said to him, look, are we doing this deal or not? He said, well, I, I, I need a bit more money. I said, I'll tell you what I do, I'll give you 50,000 more, but I wait here, you ring your solicitor now and we exchange now, no messing around. So he borrowed my brick at the time, which was like, you know, mobile phone was like a brick at the time. So he borrowed that, he rang up and we exchanged, we did the deal. Which just shows you how much sometimes you've got to drive a deal through to make it happen. Now, perhaps I paid 50,000 too much for it. Perhaps I paid 750,000 too much for it. Who knows? We made a million pounds out of the first block, refurbished it and sold it, we made a million pounds out of the first block we did. The next big block, uh, the recession came, and this is the other part of the story that is important, is that always have an out before you have an in. So always know what you're going to do if it goes wrong. So for us, it went wrong. Um, 140 flats, our bank said, look, we're not going to support you refurbishing them. We believe the market's disappearing. Uh, you're on your own. <laughs> Thank you very much. Luckily, the, Euro the European Union hasn't done much for me. But I'm a big Brexiteer. But it did do one thing in 1992, which was give me a grant for 500,000 so I could blow the block up, which we did. And then we built, um, with another grant uh, from the government, we managed to build 60 odd houses and sell them off eventually, uh, individually. So um, always have an out before you have an in and never worry about what someone else is making out of a deal. That's that. So let's talk about what we're meant to be talking about today, which, which is the market and where it's going and, and how, we're going to, how we're going to navigate the market really. So. I've survived three property recessions. This uh, situation is different to all three of those. However, I believe that the outcome could be the same. They say never catch a falling knife. So while the market's dropping, well, we don't know what it's doing at the moment, really, it's too, too soon to say. But if it's starting to drop, 
Certainly don't catch a falling knife. Wait till it hits the floor and bounces up off the floor. The one way you can tell that is by auctions, because auctions are a great barometer. Whatever happens in auctions happens in the general market six to nine months later. So when property, price, property prices and property starts going down, it happens in the, in the auctions first. You'll notice it first in the auctions. Auctions normally will sell 73% of their stock at auction. Why do I know that? Because we own Auction House UK for nine years. I sold my shares last year. We grew up from seven franchises to 40. I say that is because during a recession, that goes down to 50% clearance rate. So once that starts going down, you know the rest of the market's going to follow. And once that starts going up again, back up to 75%, you know that the general market will follow probably six, nine months later. So you have a, a window of opportunity, a great window. And I've made more money coming out of a property recession than at any other time because you've got less competition. You need to always make sure you've got some funds from somewhere, even if you haven't got any funds of your own find them from someone else. If the deal is good enough, you could always, always fund a deal if it's good enough. There's no excuses whatsoever. Stick to three golden rules that I have, which I've got some stick on property tribes for, which by the way is Vanessa does it and her husband Nick do a great job of that site. It's a really genuine site. And if you haven't been on it, please, please do go on. It's very good. So I put on there a while ago, my three golden rules. One, if you can't buy it and sell it, Again, immediately after you purchased it for a profit, you shouldn't be doing it. Two, if you can't buy it, refurbish it and sell it immediately after, after you've refurbished it and made a good profit, you shouldn't be doing it. And three, if you can't buy it, refurbish it, refinance it. In other words, keep it, re rent it, refinance it and move on and get the majority of your cash back. You shouldn't be doing it. So if you can't do all three of those things, ask yourself, if you can't do all three, should you be doing that deal especially at the moment your standards and the deals you can do in the next two years are going to be much better than the deals you've been doing the last two or three years i hope so because the deals i've been doing the last two or three years have been pretty hard work i bought 150 flats in ipswich spent 27 million got a grant from the got a, a loan from the government to do it <sighs> hard work I much prefer much simpler deals than that to do. And I'm looking to buy portfolios, residential portfolios over the next two, two or three years where I can buy them, break them up and sell them. Simple, straightforward, no risk, no risk. And I'm also um, starting a, net, a high net worth property fund to raise money in order to do that as well. Um, if you've got property at the moment, there's a few things you need to remember. If it's buy to let, don't worry about it. It's boring, as I say to Paul Mahoney I'm from Nova Financial. Anyone knows me and Paul, we all do a few events together. Um, he, he got accused of being boring by someone the other day because I told them, because I, I, I said uh, a few times that it, what he does is boring. But it, it's very, very safe. So buy to let, we've all got a number of portfolios across the UK, no doubt. And some of you got them in the Midlands and further afield. Nothing wrong with that at all. It's a good mix to have that and also I believe some development and some trading, trading stock as well. The buy to let at the end of the day is mortgage long term. Yes, the market might go down a bit, but it's going to come back obviously over the next 20, 25 years. So really why worry about it at all? The one question you have to ask yourself to get the answer what's happening in the next two or three years is one, do you believe unemployment will go up? If the answer to that is yes, then the next question is, do you think property will go down? And I believe that unemployment uh, and property are very are linked. I'm no, econo I'm not, no economist or anything like that. It's pretty simple. You guys out there, I'm sure what cottoned on to that much sooner than I have. So if you believe unemployment is going up, then the best, the best that property is going to do is stay, is stay level and not go down. The very best. The worst situation, probably down 30%. If you listen to Savills and some of the other guys, they're saying about five to eight percent on average. That's what they're saying is going to go down. I think there's two markets. So there's the, the domestic market where you're buying a property. And of course, if you already own a property, what do you got to worry about? You're buying another one, you're in the market, yours goes down 20 grand. You're buying a bigger house, that's gone down 100. Happy days, you've got nothing to worry about. If you're not in the market, of course, you could jump in too soon. 
uh, as a first time buyer, I accept that, but the government helping you greatly with the help to buy, help to buy scheme is a wonderful thing. I wouldn't worry too much about that either. But where you're vulnerable is if you're looking to develop properties in the next two years, because you don't know what that, those properties are going to be worth in two years' time. So that's why in the next two or three years, I don't want to do any big schemes like I've been doing in the last five years. I want to be doing properties that are finished. If I can, if I can just trade properties at a discount because I'm buying in bulk and then selling them off individually, lovely. If I've got to take on projects and finish them because developers got into difficulty, I don't mind doing that because that's a short, even, even though it's a pain in the ass, it's short. It doesn't take too long to do. So I need to make sure that I am, I'm trading, I'm fleet of foot, I'm not stuck in some big development for three years, not knowing what those properties are going to be worth in three years' time because no one knows what they're going to be worth. No one knows. One thing I would say, of course, there's a housing shortage in the south of the country and that will remain and also in the Midlands, I accept that. Up north, of course, there's never been a housing shortage and they're never likely to be. So if you're buying properties up north, just be wary of that. If you're buying them up north, you want to try and make sure you buy them in areas of large populations, Manchester, Liverpool probably. I mean, Birmingham obviously has done incredibly well over the last few years, really well. And you've got the train coming. Everyone thought that, that Boris might, might cancel that, but he hasn't done. Um, we've also, don't forget, got Brexit coming down the, the train line as well. And my, I've got a few political contacts. I'm chairman of the Ipswich Conservatives. My contacts aren't brilliant, but they're okay. And I'm told they're not interested in doing a deal. They want to come out with that without a trade deal if they have to. And that then can cause perhaps more problems next year. Perhaps some of you think, no, you know what? That's great. We can, we can row our own boat. All this business about um, level playing field, having the same tax regime as the rest of Europe, we don't have to do. You know, are we stronger on our own? I believe we are long term, certainly short term. I'm not so sure. So we'll have to see where we are. If, you're, if you've got a site and you haven't started it and you don't need to start it, I would just sit back and just see what the market is going to do. If you're halfway through a site, get it finished because otherwise you could be dealing with someone like me and you won't want to be doing that, I can assure you. Because if you buy, you know, we're going to be looking at you and you can't finish it. We'll go, you know what? You're going to have to take some medicine here because it's not finished. We don't know where the market's going. So if you can finish it, get it finished. The other thing, if you get it finished, you've got options, hopefully. You can rent it, you can refinance it, or you can sell them. At the moment, if you're half finished, you've only got one thing to do. You've only got one option, and that's not good. So going back to options again, have as many options as you can going forward. Mark, what's the time like? You know, okay, Mo, you've, you've got about another four or five minutes yet. But... Have I? Goodness me, I've been talking too quickly. I was worried. I, I, I was worried. Um, Mark, ask me a question. Any question you want. Uh, there's a shortage of this one from, from Mitt, actually. Um, right. Who kept on first. So yep. shortage, of, shortage of homes. Will the government not support SME developers to meet these requirements? Well, of course, of course they have done. And I was, I was having, I had a meeting with, well, we've had a lot of housing ministers. I had a meeting with a housing minister and a, a number of other people uh, not that long ago. And um, the, um, Homes England, which is a fund that's been set up, will now lend to developers with a minimum of five, want to build a minimum of five houses. Up till this point, they wouldn't do anybody they wouldn't lend to anyone who wanted to do less, didn't want to do less than 50. Now, they do, now they'll lend to people who will do five. So the government are doing their very best to help. At the moment, we're building about um, 240,000 houses a year. They want to get up that to, to 350,000 a year. The truth is they need to get it up to 500,000. They understand that. They know that. They're driving that housing forward. Um, um, Robert Jenner, who I've met on a couple of occasions, he's the Secretary of State for Housing. Um, he understands this situation, he understands how serious it is, and they're driving forward. But the planning system in this country is holding them back. Um, I'm part of a think tank that, um, that is, reports to the government uh, on how we can change the, the planning system. Some of my ideas I don't like, I'm sure, is a bit too radical for them. But uh, <laughs> um, I think in the, in the mid, I mean, everything's been thrown out by COVID, but I think the idea is that they, they speed up the process much much quicker than it is now now whether they can do that because they're being held back all the time by the local authorities 
It's incredibly complicated and difficult, but that's what they're trying to do. Uh, how far do you see the market actually falling? What's your prediction? Well, I think, I believe, and I think most people would agree that it's a micro market. So if you're in Derby, good luck. Because if Rolls-Royce get rid of 5,000, 6,000, 7,000 jobs, guess what's going to happen to the Derby property market? It's not going to be good news. If you're, you know, in 2008, nine, I've still got them. I've got a quite a large block of flats in Brighton we've owned for a number of years. Now, Brighton never went down in 2008, 2009 recession. It never went down. It stayed the same. Yet, uh, hasn't gone up that much in the last few years so it's a micro market depending where you are it will depend how the market reacts to this and in some areas I, don't, I expect it won't go down in other areas it will in my experience the last areas to go up normally aren't very nice areas and when there comes a recession or a downturn they're the first to go down so I have to keep on putting it on mute. Um, Farin has said, do you think the government will make further changes to the tax system, considering that they're printing money like there is now tomorrow? <laughs> that, is up for, that is up for discussion and tax-free for the pension withdrawal. It's property <coughs> in terms of the council tax for second home. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, all I would say to that is that stamp duty uh, is the one thing, everyone bangs out about 3% plus for, for poor, our poor old investors who are on this call uh, and myself and everyone else, um, I don't see the government doing anything about stamp duty because they see it is, a, I mean, 4,000 properties um, a day are sold in the UK, 1.2 million a year. That brings in huge amounts of money for the revenue. And guess what? That's exactly what they're going to need going forward. If the property market stalls, if it stalls, and I don't believe the domestic market will stall. I think people will have problems with bridging and, and all because they won't be able to borrow as much from the banks and so on on the trading investment dealing side. But I think on the domestic side, I'm also hoping that because I've got 35 million quids worth of property to sell this year, Mark. So I don't need the market to go down. Um, so uh, we'll see. But I don't believe they'll touch stamp duty unless the, the market stalls. If it stalls, they're going to have to do something. But I think that is their last resort to have to start changing stamp duty. Uh, one from Gosha. Um, a lot of office buildings will be empty as we migrate to work online. Do you think offices can be repurposed um, to meet the housing needs? Yeah, Gosha, yes, absolutely. I think what's going to happen um, is that a lot of people, uh, they've now obviously realised they can work from, the bosses have realised that people can work from home. They can, be, they can be accountable by technology and everything else. Um, and um, so I think, I think that's really important. Um, I think they're still going to have to go into work, perhaps only two days a week, not five, and work from home the rest of the time. It'll take time to, because of the, everyone's on you know, long leases quite often on, shop, on offices, it'll take time to, for the market to adjust to it all. And obviously, um, you know, at the, at the moment, permitted development happens. You know, the government are keen to keep that going. They've increased that in the last, well, the white paper's out. It hasn't become law, but you're going to be able to uh, build, uh, um, uh, go higher on, on, predict, on, um, on PD. You're going to be able to build on, on, on flat roofs and stuff without, without planning permission. You'll still need to get permission, but not planning um going forward although that isn't that isn't through yet so i think um offices to residential yes it's going to continue big tip on office to residential though be very careful if you cannot supply cycle stores or bin stores yeah cycle racks or bin stores in your potential development you will not get pd that's the one thing they can turn you down on and they'll have great delight, these local authorities, in turning you down because they hate it. They absolutely hate it. So um, make sure you've got room on the ground floor for cycle stores and you need at least one per flat. Maybe some areas you will need two per flat and make sure you've got enough bin stores because if you haven't, they'll turn you down. Don't go buying it and then just buying it because it's office, you definitely think you'll get residential. Also, if it's in a mixed area, not a very nice area and it's more commercial than residential, be very careful because although you can buy it and maybe develop it, there's nothing to say that people can buy them off you because if building societies think that area is too commercial, they won't lend money on it. 
Okay, no, I think your time's up, but we'll, we'll chuck one more in. We've got a couple more after this. There's a few people who have said that over the years, Mark, <laughs> but I'm still going. <laughs> um, Mandate says, where do you think there's going to be the most demand for properties in the next five years? Commercial, warehouses, small houses, flats, etc. Where do you think? Well, it's be? very interesting. Warehouses, warehouses is good, are good news. In the old days, that we used to call them sheds. That's what they used to be called. And in the old days, warehouses were the bottom of the investment pile. You know, if you couldn't buy anything else, you, you, you could afford a warehouse. That's changed with Amazon and everything else. Domest, uh, you know, shops obviously are, are on a downer, a big, big downer. Offices to residential, of course, you know, we've just spoken about that. Um, it's it's it, conversion into flats. You know, we need accommodation, especially in the South, uh, for people to rent and to live in. Uh, there's nothing wrong with the property market whatsoever going forward. It will adjust. Um, it will adjust price-wise, I'm sure. If it takes a few people out the market, and it means the rest of us on this call can get on and make more money, happy days. <laughs>